evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends, thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture will come from Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. And it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Praise him. God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you again, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Father God, for just being good and being God. We say hallowed to your name. We glorify you. We lift you, Lord God. We bless your name for you are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Now, Father God, we come admitting to our sins. Father God, we confess them. We call them out. We realize that we have fallen short. We've messed up. We, Father God, have missed the mark. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, Father God. And bless us on tonight that we will hear your word, that we will adhere to your word, that we will walk in your word, obey your word. 
that your word, Father God, will continue to be a light to us and a lamp to us. We ask you to bless us tonight that your word will speak to us very clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray that you keep us, Father God, in your word. And in Jesus' name we pray that you keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. He is worthy. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise Jesus. Jesus, blessed Savior, He is, He is, He is worthy, He is the blessed Savior, and He is worthy of all our praises. He is worthy of our praise. Thank God for Jesus the Christ. He's given us another chance, hasn't he? God has given us one more again. Hallelujah. Another chance to get it right with him. And uh, if we're still breathing, still on planet Earth, that means that he's not through with us and we ought not be through with him. Amen. We have a little more, a lot more to do to honor and praise our God. We're in 2 John, in the back of your Bible, right before you get to Revelation, you run into 2 John. 2 John. It's in the back of the New Testament. 2 John. We will begin at verse number 7, and we look to end at verse number 13, closing out tonight the book of 2 John. 2 John. 2 John, verses 7 through 13 is where we are on tonight. John, the, the apostle, is talking again to us, those who are saved. At this time, he's talking to the early church, and he's reminding them that there are some deceivers and antichrists out there. There are deceivers and antichrists. Well, last week, we closed out that particular pericope talking about the fact that we have to walk in God. We have to walk in faith. We have to live in faith. This word walk not, is not talking about putting one foot in front of the other, but it's talking about walking in Christ, keeping his commandments, making sure that we have a conversation. The word conversation means our lifestyle. Making sure we have a lifestyle that is in obedience to God himself. He reminded us on last week that there is what is known as the elect lady. What is the elect lady? The elect lady. The elect lady. The elect lady. The elect lady. Somebody breathing or somebody's talking? The church. The church. The church. The chosen church. The, the church. The church that's been saved. He's talking to the elect lady. The church herself is a female. The church is the bride of Christ. The church will never be the bride of the pastor. The church is the bride of Christ. Christ, Because no pastor has ever died for the church. Jesus died for the church. He gave his life for the church. He was killed for the church. He voluntarily gave his life for the church. And I'm telling you, he is the groom that's coming back one day to get his bride. And the situation is perfect right now for him to come back. <laughs> Nothing else has to be, be done. Jesus can come any moment right now to get his church. And the Bible teaches that he's coming to get a church without a spot or without a wrinkle. Meaning we got to get it right. My, my, my. The thing about it is we can't get it right without him. So he's talking to the elect lady. And then when he talks about some of your children, he means some of the members of the church. Some of your children, some of the members of the church just delight me and I'm rejoicing because of them. Because I've found out that they are obedient to the truth. Every pastor is excited when the members of the church are obedient to what he has been preaching. What he has been teaching. I can tell when folk don't attend Bible study, doesn't list, don't listen to it. I can tell when people are not in Sunday school. 
I can tell when people are not paying attention on Sunday morning. I can tell when people just in the church and the church is not in them because they don't walk in obedience to Christ. And the other way I can tell is that every little thing disturbs them. Every little thing disturbs them. Everything. If the weatherman forecasts something going to happen, oh, my goodness, it just throws them off. You can just talk about a hurricane and some people get nervous. You can talk about talk about trouble in the medical field and some people just fall to pieces. It's because when you are walking in obedience to the Lord, you know trials will come. You know things will happen. Yeah, Jimmy Kimmel is getting a lot of slack because he said that people are, are so bent out of shape because a 96-year-old queen died. I mean, he's getting all kinds of slack. Another, another late night show host is getting a lot of slack because he actually, I felt like he was actually making fun of the fact that people are so bent out of shape because a 96-year-old queen has died. The question becomes, did we not know that sooner or later mortality would sit in? Did we not know that sooner or later when a person has lived a right to be a ripe old life, sooner or later they got to leave here? And if we're going to get to heaven, if Jesus tarry, if we're going to get to heaven, we got to leave here in death. If Jesus doesn't show up and rapture the church, we're going to have to leave here. There's an appointed time for every one of us. And God is not, Sister Brown, going to call your number. He's going to call your name. And when he calls your name, it doesn't matter how many other people in this world have the same name you have. He knows which name to call. And he knows who he's calling. And guess what? Whoever he's calling is going to respond. They're going to respond by stop by the stopping of movement, by the, the hesitation of breath, by no more heartbeat. We're going to respond. We got to respond. Because God knows how to call our name. He won't call our number. He has to call. He will call our name. So he says that we are walking in the truth because we are children of God. We are obedience to the commandment of God. And he says he rejoiced over the whole church, which brings us to verse number seven. Second John, verse seven. For many deceivers, he's, he's justifying why he's telling us to walk in faith now. He's justifying why he's telling us to maintain hope. In verse seven, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. He says very clearly right off the bat, he doesn't beat around the corner, doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't jump over the mountain. He does not swim through the river. He says, if there's a person who does not confess that Jesus Christ is coming or has come in the flesh, he is, first of all, a deceiver. This, this, word, this word deceiver, this word deceiver means one who leads astray. A deceiver is somebody that, that leads one astray. And notice the, the indefinite article and, meaning that it is an antichrist, meaning that it is a form of Christ, antichrist, meaning that it is somebody that's against Christ, but he does not use the definite article the, meaning that he is not the antichrist. So what he's saying is there are a lot of antichrists around here, Christ, antichrist with the S. There's a whole heap of them. And he, he puts it on Front Street and he says to us tonight that the fact of the matter is you can tell when a man is a deceiver. 
You can tell when a man is leading some people astray, and you can tell when a man, woman, boy, girl is an antichrist, is an antichrist, is when they do not confess, do not say, do not believe, and do not communicate that Jesus has come or Jesus is coming in the flesh. Wow. Very, very simple, very straightforward. He says this person is a deceiver and this person is an antichrist. He is against Christ. The reason why John addresses these issues because during these days, there were false prophets that had to view that they did not believe that Jesus will come in the flesh, nor has he come in the flesh. Therefore, they did not believe in incarnation. I didn't say reincarnation. I said incarnation. And when we talk about incarnation, it is the fact that Christ has come in the flesh. It is the fact that God has rolled himself up in flesh, came to this world by way of Jesus the Christ, got off in a place called Bethlehem of Judea, he has been incarnated. The statement is very clear that he is the visible image of an invisible God. He has been incarnated, meaning that God has rolled himself up in flesh. He's the incarnate God. Questions or comments? So he says, the deceiver don't believe this. He says the antichrist doesn't believe this. The deceiver, one who leads people astray, he leads them away. And these men are teachers. Don't you know, don't you know that somebody's following everybody? Everybody got a follower or two or three, a bunch of them. And just because we have packed churches doesn't mean that we are, are great leaders. Just because we got a large group of people does not suggest and does not mean that we're leading the godly way. Just because you can dance or sing or run or jump or shout, the question becomes, what happens when you hit the ground? You see... Antichrist deals with the emotions. The deceiver deals with, with how hype he can get you. We're not in the middle of a football game. We're in real life situations. You see, in a, on a football field, you can see them jumping before they, they leave the building. You can see them hyping each other up. You can see the leaders going around, getting in each other's face. Tell them, come on, we got this, we got this. That's not the preacher's responsibility to hype you up. It's not the preacher's responsibility to get you pumped. It is our responsibility to say it the way God has laid it out. Preacher said to me, when I was early in seminary, he said to me, you don't have to hoop to get the people riled up. He was making a statement to the whole class because I'm not a hooper because I can't sing. Are you with me? So you don't have to hoop to get the people riled up. He said to me, he said, good meat makes his own gravy. If you cook it right, if you study it right, if you present it right, it will make his own gravy. Good meat makes his own gravy. And then he showed me a video. He said, now watch this. I never hooped on this video, but watch the people in the choir stand respond. Lives are changed when we give it to people the way God has given it to us. And we are never extra biblical when we obey God and follow his leadership. So he says to them, be on guard because there are deceivers and there are antichrists out there. And he says, he says to us, 
I'm just telling you who they are. The fact of the matter is these deceivers are those who do not confess that Christ has come in the flesh or Christ is coming in the flesh at the time of this writing. This word flesh means incarnation, coming in the flesh. The phrase is incarnation. When we look at Colossians chapter 2, let's turn Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. Colossians chapter 2, go back a little bit to your left. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9. It tells the story of who Christ is. That one verse, that one verse tells us of Christ's incarnation. Incarnation, his his life in the flesh. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. In Christ. What does it say? How many different versions we have? Who has New King James? One, two. Who has King James? One, two. Okay, let's go with those two. Someone stand and read what King James says right quick for me. Real loud, real big. King James, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. What does King James say? Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwells all fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay. It says in him. He's talking about Jesus. The way we know he's talking about Jesus because the whole pericope in the whole chapter is talking about Jesus. He says in him dwells the fullness of and of the Godhead bodily. In him dwells God bodily. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the incarnate God who has New King James. You stand and read that real big for me, New King James. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For in him dwells all the fullness, Godhead bodily. Again, the word bodily is there. Are you with me? So in Jesus Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. All of it. It's incarnation. So he says, be careful, little children. Be on God, little children. Be on God, the elect saints of the elect lady. Be on God, the elect ones of the body of Christ. For if any man does not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, Jesus Christ in his incarnate body, this is a deceiver in an antichrist. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, your opinion on the New Living Translations, and, and that's what I normally study from. I notice it says something a little bit different. Okay, read New Living Translation for me. Y'all excuse me for sitting down. Uh, but now it says, For in Christ live all the fullness of God in a human body. Okay, exactly. I'm glad you said that. That's my next point. My next point is, in Christ... In Christ lives God in a human body. In other words, God has taken on a human body. And that body is in Christ. In Christ Jesus, he shows forth God. The, the only thing we can do, the best that we can do is be like him. But Jesus, here it is, the hyperstatic union who who going to tell me what the hyperstatic union is? The, yes, sir. A hyperstatic. You got another question? Uh, no, hyperstatic union uh, means that Christ is all human and all God. That's what the definition says. Yeah. Right. So Christ is fully human and fully God. As we move through this particular pericope, you will see that John is saying that this this Christ. This Jesus Christ himself is fully human. And the reason why John points this out at this particular time is because there were some 
who said during that day, the false teacher said that Christ wasn't really human. He just seemed to be that way. But we know that Christ was really human. How we know he's human? He hurt like we hurt. How we know he's human? He was born of a, a, a body from the body of a woman. How we know he's human? He died. How we know he's human is because he bled. How do we know he's human? Because he hurt. He had pains in his body like we had in our, our body. But when you look at any of these versions, it says to us tonight that because he is incarnate, because he is the carnation of God, he, God has shown up in the body. Isn't that something? It says God has just shown up in the body. And it says any man that doesn't believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, he is a deceiver and he is an antichrist. Look at verse number eight. Look to yourself that we do not lose those things we work hard for, we worked hard for, but that we may receive a full reward. And he's going to explain this as we go further. He's saying that we worked hard for some things. What he's saying is we, you were born into Judaism and Jude, as a Judaizer. And as you were born into this thing, you did not know Christ. But now, since you know Christ, you have worked hard just to live for Christ. You have worked hard just to learn about Christ. You know, there are some people, even today, there are some people who, whose lives are threatened if they change from one religion over to Christianity. Their parents disown them. Uh, the brothers of the faith look to kill them. And such it was in this day. He said, we have worked hard. We have worked hard. Now look at what he says. He says, we. It is believed that some translators included we because John includes himself in the fact that, that whatever the body loses, everybody in the body loses. So he's saying that as the body lose rewards, I have to include myself. If I fall away, then I lose my rewards. As we go further, we will see that he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's talking about losing rewards. It says it right here. It says, but that we may receive a full reward. The reverse is as true, and we'll see that. The reverse is that you will not receive a full reward if you do not stick with what we work so hard to get. Got to stick with it. Says, he says we will receive a full reward. So we can't throw salvation in here because the text doesn't throw salvation in here. In order for the text to be true, the whole entire text has to be true. Right? He says, look, look to yourselves. That we, we do not lose those things we worked hard for. Those things we worked for. Those things we have believed for. I know it's terrible English, but that's how it's written. End in a sentence with a preposition. I, I'm, I'm just reading. Then he says, but that we receive a full reward. That we may receive a full reward. A reward in full. How many of you have ever gone to human resources or to benefits or payday and said, y'all got my check wrong? Anybody? I've, I've done that. He said, wait a minute. I only got 36 hours. I work 40 hours. Or you gave me 40 hours, but my pay is not right. Or my hourly rate is not right. I've been there. What he's saying is, you worked hard to get somewhere. You, you have been diligent in the faith. Stay with it. The reward is coming. Payday is coming. That's why the, that's why the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 6, 
verse 23, it says, it says to us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So he doesn't deal with salvation in the text. But God has a gift. And as he has, has given us salvation, we also have rewards. I want all of them. You want all yours? We, we fight over who has a mansion down here. Forget about the mansion down here. We talk bad about people who drive what they want to drive. Forget about what we're driving down here. Moth and rust will eat it up. I mean, some people be dead. I mean, they are decked out. I, I remember, and, and, and McGill can, can, can relate to this, and he can, he can confirm this. McGill and I went to the house, and, and man, when this lady steps out the house, and she is decked to the nine. I mean, she has the right heels on. She has the right colors on. She, she has, the, she has the, the right clothes on. She has the right persona. And she walks in. Her head is up. Her shoulders are back. I mean, you just you can just look at her and tell that her house is in order. You can tell that every room in her house is in order. But Big Mama used to tell me, boy, if you're going to date a girl, make sure when you go over to visit, go to the restroom. Uh -huh. Just why she tell me to go to the restroom? Uh, see, see, because we grew up in the era where there were shotgun houses. And usually the restroom was either in the middle of the house or in the back of the house. She said, boy, if you ever want to know if a girl is nasty, go to the restroom every time you get there. Make sure you go to the restroom. Because up front where she takes company, that's what they call it back home, where she takes company is always going to be clean. It's going to be spotless. It's going to be immaculate. But go to the restroom. It took me some years, but at 22 years old, I moved to Houston. Now I know why Big Mama said, make sure you go to the restroom. I went to the restroom here in Houston, Texas, and I was considering dating this girl. When I turned the light on, it was like a fire drill in there. Pew, 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 pew. I mean, critters running everywhere. I came out of there and I was singing that song, I won't be back, I won't be back no more. No more. <laughs> you see, what we have to understand is that people will always put on a facade, a show. But we really, really, really need the rewards, and when you know you need the reward, you do what's best for the reward. Obedience unto the Lord himself. He says, you need to receive a, a, a real full reward because you worked so hard to get here. You worked for it. He says you worked for it. He said, and since you worked for it, get the reward. Now he, t he brings up another point. The point is, you don't work for salvation, you work, you work for the reward. Jesus has already died and rose for the salvation, you just have to accept him. But the reward is up to you. You can do whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, how you want to do it, with whom you want to do it. Just remember, you either cut your reward or build up your reward. What is the first promise in the in the um, the first promise in the Ten Commandments with with a promise? What which Ten Commandment gives us the first promise? Honor your, Honor your father and your mother, for your days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. In other words, honor your father and mother, so you will have a full reward of a full life. Honor your father and your mother. Respect them. Stick with them. Support them. Love them. Don't be ashamed of them. Sometimes when boys get around 12, 13, mama, don't walk me to the door. Mama, don't kiss me on the jaw like that in front of everybody. Don't be doing me like that. That's embarrassing. Whereas you don't realize that there's another boy who never had a kiss from his mama at all. And he wished that he could get a hug from her. It says respect them, to honor them. In other words, to build them up and support them. 
I tell children all the time, now look, when you get grown, it's time for folks to stop taking care of you and for you to take care of your folk. Are you with me? When you get grown, you ought to get yourself to a point where you don't have to be taken care of by your family. You ought to be willing, ready, and able to take care of your family. Am I making sense? There ought to be a point where you can get yourself together. This is the great United States of America. We ought to get to a point in our lives where we can get ourselves together so much so until we can reward our parents or our neighbors or people in the neighborhood for what they've done for us. If it's no more than go visit them when they're sick. We ought to get ourselves together so we can give out rewards instead of keep taking, keep taking, keep taking. Young people can become leeches. Let me make it clear, like back home, can become ticks. Ticks start off real little, like microscopic animals, but then when they get on dogs and cats, you can mess around, they get that big. And it makes the dog and the cat miserable. Let us not make our folk miserable. <laughs> Matter of fact, let us not make God miserable. Let us be obedient, walk in faith, walk with the Lord. We worked hard for this. And he, he keeps in mind, keep us in mind that this is concerning false doctrine, false teaching, heresy. And heresy was running wild. And guess what? In the 20th century, in the 21st century, heresy is running wild. What is heresy? Somebody. False teaching. False doctrine, false teaching, false people that just say stuff and people believe it. It's amazing to me that people can just say something. And we've seen that for the last six years. People can just say something. And they know it's not true. And 80,000 people jump on board. I just can't see it. And then they get to the point where they hear it so long. Until they start believing it. They still tell it. I mean, men have gone to jail. Men have gone to prison. And they still, still believe it. I'm not talking about you, am I? I mean, stuff that you, you know is not... He says that there are some deceivers and some antichrists among you, some false teachers, false preachers among you, and they are trying to pull you away from what you have believed, pull you away from what you worked for, pull you away from what God has done in your life. Let's look at verse number nine. Whoever trespasses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Remember now, that in order for the pericope to be true, the whole pericope has to be true. Remember, he started off by talking about if you do not believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, then you are not a part of God. So he says in, in verse number nine, he says, whosoever trespasses against him does not abide in the doctrine of Christ and does not have God. So if you don't abide in the fact that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, God has been incarnated. You're not of God. You do not have God. You, if you don't have this doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. In order to get to God, we got to go through Christ. In order to get, to get through to God, we have to go through Christ. What do you say every time you pray? Whether you begin your, your prayer or you end your prayer, what do you say? In Jesus' name, right? In the name of Jesus. And why do we do that? Because we know when we can't get to God, Jesus can. And that we know the only way to get to him is through Jesus. His son. Oftentimes, to give the analogy that oftentimes boys and girls will come to the house and then they will say, Megan, ask your daddy, ask your mama, can we have this? Because they know they have no right to go into the refrigerator and pull something out. And then they'll be singing that song, I can't go back, I can't go back anymore. 
So you go through the son in order to get to the father. And this is the same son that's been incarnated. It is the same son that left his place in glory, made his way to these mundane shores. It is the same son, Jesus Christ, that has saved us, healed us, and blessed our sin sick souls. The same son. So whosoever trespasses and does not, whosoever, this word trespass means when you go into somebody else's property. Whosoever transgress, when you go into somebody else's property, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. In other words, if you turn your back on what you've been taught, I've already told you now, don't transgress. Keep in mind, he's not talking about losing salvation. He's talking about justifying your reward. He's talking about making sure you don't sacrifice your reward. So he says, whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He's not talking about losing your salvation. He's not talking about you don't have God in your soul. He's talking about you don't have God's approval. If you transgress to this and do not abide in this doctrine of Christ, then God ain't with you. He's saying that you're doing it on your own. Have you ever heard your parents say, well, go on and do it then? And sometimes they'll say, well, if you're big and bad, you, you go on and do what you want. What they're saying is, I'm not with you. I'm not for that. I've known Parents kick children out because they had drugs in the house. And it's like, hey, I ain't with you. Do your own thing. And when you look at Romans chapter 7, you will find out that there's a wrestle going on. There's a fight going on between the inner man, the God spirit, and the flesh itself. And that wrestle, that fight is going on in all of us. And it doesn't matter how holy you are. The apostle Paul said, I'm, I've been saved. I speak all these languages. I know the word of God. I saw Jesus for myself. I'm an apostle. I will do season. And guess what? I still got a war going on within me. Anybody else in the room got a war going on? Anybody? Just one person got a war. Every now and then you, you wrestle with this and you wrestle with that. And I'm talking about more than just being indecisive. I'm talking about wrestling because you're struggling to do what's right or you're struggling to do what's wrong. Apostle Paul was pretty holy. The Apostle Paul says, I got a war going on within me. He says, not only that, I'm a wretched man and I'm struggling with this thing. And I don't know which way to turn, oh wretched man I am, oh burdensome person, oh, oh beat down man that I am. Somebody got to deliver me. He gets to verse 25 of Romans chapter 7. He says, I thank God that Jesus Christ is the one. Through Jesus Christ I am delivered. So whosoever do not hold on to this doc doctrine, they lose their reward. He says, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. He who abides in this doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You can't have the Son without the Father. You can't have the Father without the Son. That's just the way God has set it up. If by, and, and if you're going to have the son, you got to abide in the doctrine. This, this, word, this word abide means that, that you're going to live in it. This word abide means that you're going to continue in it. This word abide means that you're going to own it and take it home with you. And take it everywhere you go. This doctrine, you must own up to it. This doctrine, you must abide in it. This doctrine of Christ, you must believe in it until it changes your heart day by day. The old people would say like this, he gets sweeter and sweeter, wrong by wrong. And then they would say, round by round. Every day with Jesus gets sweeter day 
by day. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. My, my, my. Let me kind of explain this because I know that sounds kind of harsh. You see, first of all, the biblical writers said it like it, it was. These days, sugar coats take over. I mean, you have preachers sugarcoating it, you have deacons sugarcoating it, you have the missionaries super sugarcoating it, you have the, the supervisors sugarcoating it. People just sugarcoating stuff to make people feel good. But the Bible has said that people will not give in to sound doctrine. They will want stuff that tickle their ears. They want you to sugarcoat it. They want you to make it taste good. Make, make, make me feel good, preacher. Don't, don't, whatever you do, hurry up and sit down, and whatever you do, don't step on my toes. But biblical writers didn't mind stepping on toes. They died because they stepped on toes. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. Let me set the stage for you. The fact of the matter is, they would welcome teachers and preachers as they travel. This is set out for traveling teachers and traveling preachers. And they will go from one place to the other. And as they travel, people will welcome them into their house, allow them to stay over, allow them to spend time. They would take them in. They would give them a place to rest. They would give them a table and a lamp to write with and to study the word. At that time, they studied from the stroll. And they would make sure that the preacher, the teacher was comfortable. They were much like itinerary preachers evangelists that went from place to place. And so he says, John says, what you do now, if one of them come and they teach this doctrine that does not recognize Christ coming in the flesh, don't even let them come in your house. He says, withdraw your hospitality from them. Questions or comments? He says, withdraw it from them. He says, don't welcome them into your house. And when he talks about the fact that he don't want you to welcome them in the house, then he goes on and said, don't even greet them. And when he's, he's not talking about being mean. What he's saying, when you come to somebody's door, you greet them with a smile. You tell them that it's good to see them. You welcome them and tell them that I got your bedroom here. I got a table for you to look at your books here. I got a place for you to eat here. And I will have breakfast ready for you in the morning. He says, don't greet them like that. He says, don't even let them in your house. Somebody ought to have a question right now. Is that harsh? Is that bad? He says, don't even let him in your house and nor do you greet him. Verse 11. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. You know, we grew up all the time telling our children, right? Birds of a feather flock together. You lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. John picked this thought up. <laughs> he says, don't greet him in your house. Don't welcome him in your house. Because when you greet him, you share his evil deeds. In other words, if you make him comfortable, he's going to be, he's, it, the blood is going to be on your head for supporting his false doctrine. Woo! He says, if you greet him, he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. You, you're just as bad as the other. Children riding in a car together, police pull them over, one person got drugged. Guess, guess what? Guess who goes to jail? All four or five of them. Why is that? Why, why do all of them go to jail? Everybody's saying that's his. Why all of us got to go? Because you share in his evil deed. Because the police officer doesn't know who it belonged to. Matter of fact, the police officer doesn't care who it belongs to. Matter of fact, the police officer is able to put five notches on his belt rather than one on his belt. 
The Bible says you're sharing his evil deeds. Finally, John writes this farewell greeting. Having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Verse 13. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So after John talks to them about this false doctrine, he talks to them about false teachers. He warns them about hypocrisy and heresy. He says, I got a lot of more things to share with you. He says, I, I really want to share more with you, but I don't want to put it in a letter. I want to come and be with you and sit with you face to face. He says, I don't want to continue to share with you by writing a letter. I want to show up and be with you face to face. Let me ask this question. How valuable of a time was it for you during COVID-19 when you couldn't see anybody? When you couldn't go anywhere? Some people were so miserable they snuck out anyway. Lady told me, I don't want to use the word she used, but let me just use the word side chick. How about that? They said all the side chicks were miserable. Because they couldn't leave out the house to get to them. So when we, we all need human touch, right? We all need human communication. We all need somebody to, to greet us. We all need somebody to approve us. How many people in this room don't even care if anybody ever tell them they're doing a good job? Anybody? How many people don't care if anybody ever praised them for a good job? How many people here don't care if people never show up at your house? <laughs> um, Steve Harvey was doing, he, he was doing the, the game Family Feud. And you know, sometimes people get caught up in the midst of it. And the question was something like, um, name one thing you can do without for a year. And right away, he slammed on the buzzer and he said, wife, my wife. <laughs> and then the caption comes up, phew, divorced. <laughs> so we need somebody. I know you got Jesus. I know Jesus is with you. I know you got the Lord on your side. But we need people. So John closes this out. He closes it out by saying farewell to you all. And for now, I got some more things I want to say. But because I got some more things I want to say, I want to say it face to face. I want to be up close with you. I want us to be able to share and fellowship together. We need to fellowship. There were people calling me when COVID-19 was alive and really blooming and we didn't know which way to turn. It was before a vaccine. People were calling me saying, when you going to open up the church? I'm ready. And I'm saying, you weren't coming to church when church was open. Now you want to come to church in the middle of a pandemic to make a statement. I got, I received more calls from people who are not here on Wednesday, not here on Tuesday, not here on Sunday than anybody that was coming to church on a regular basis. Brother Miles, why is that? I mean, they, they didn't show, and then you got people who want to show up when they're sick. And when they were well, they wasn't showing up. It is because we want to be close to each other. So John closes out and John says, I got a lot of other things I want to talk to you all about. But in the midst of my looking to talk to you about it, I don't want to use paper and pen to talk to you. 
I want to talk to you face to face. I want to speak to you face to face that our joy will be full. In other words, I want to come and rejoice with you. And I want to come and let you rejoice with me. I want to come and have kononia. Word means that I want to come and fellowship with you. I mean, there were people during the COVID-19 period that said that they were just so miserable because the closest they could get to a person was by phone call. But let me tell you something. My mother-in-law wore out FaceTime. I mean, wore it out. Now she, at 83, I think she, she got it down pat. I mean, FaceTime face is the best thing face to face could do for her. And I mean, she, I mean, they don't start charging her for FaceTime. It's because we need each other. We, we, the songwriter says, I need you. You need me. We are part of this great family. I won't hurt you. Don't you hurt me. John says, I got some things I want to say, but I want to be face to face when I talk to you. Let me, let me share with you. When you have something serious to say, don't call them on the phone. Right. Don't put it in a text. Don't put, people now put it on Facebook where everybody else can see it. People have loved ones who are passing away and the wife and the husband find out that their spouse have passed away by some child putting it on Facebook. Some 40 year old child, put, my daddy died today and the wife doesn't even know yet. Come on now. He says, this letter is from your sister church. He says, amen, it is so. He says, I'm telling you, I want to talk to you. I want to be there for you. I want to fellowship with you. And that's what church ought to be about. It ought to be about fellowship, fun, activity. We ought to, we ought to make sure that we love on each other. You can take it for granted if you want to. Let me tell you, time is running out. You better kiss them every time you show up and kiss them every time you leave. Time is winding up. And you don't have to be old to leave here. You have to make sure you treat each other right because you never know, and then you're going to come to the funeral, home, funeral and give me trouble uh, talking about, oh, put me in there with me. I should have been me. No, you should have done what you're supposed to do while he was living. Guilty folk cry and fall out and act crazy. I'm, I'm not talking about don't cry, but what I am saying, don't act out. We don't need the drama. I've had the referee at two funerals already. But when you, when, you, when you are approaching life right and you're following God's principles, you don't have to worry about it when you've done all you can do. When you've done all you can do, you can stand before God, get your rewards because you've done what you can do. It's when you misuse, mistreat it, and miss the moments that you're going you're gonna to regret it. So John says, I want to tell you, and I want to tell you in person. I want to fellowship with you. And this fellowship is only made possible through Jesus Christ. The only way we can have real fellowship is that we're saved, that we're born again, that we've trusted the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And if there's anybody here tonight who never trusts the story, that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose from the dead. This is your moment. You can be saved right here, right now. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can come to Jesus just as you are. If you're here live or if you're online live, just trust Jesus as your savior. Believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, he died on a skull hill called Calvary. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. 
and he rose from the dead. If this is you, why don't you join me in inviting Christ into your life? Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, you're now born again, that, that you're on your way to heaven when you die. And heaven is a beautiful place, and he's looking forward to welcoming you home. Jesus is. If you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. You can inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of this church, and we'll be glad to fellowship with you. If you've received Christ as your Savior, inbox us and let us know when we will rejoice with you and celebrate with you in your new life in Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. It is now offering time and it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. And if you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving to Zell, by way of Zell. You can Zell us at lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zell account. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77. 459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless every giver. And bless us, Father God, that we will give not grudgingly nor out of necessity. For God, we know you love a cheerful giver. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your offering present with you, you can come now and give unto the Lord. If you're giving electronically, you can give at this moment. Let's sing that together. Be you are in order. I need you to survive. You are important to me. I need you to. I need you. You need me. You are a part of my turn with me. Agree with me, you are a part of God's plan. It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important to me, I need you to survive. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for every gift. We thank you for every giver. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying, Amen. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.